Five minutes past ten, our talkback lawyer David Whiting is here to take your calls and help you with free legal advice. 1300 222 774 is the number if you want some free legal advice. 1300 222 774. Uh, as we speak, David, good morning to you. Good morning, John. As we speak, uh, the Archbishop of Adelaide, who is in trouble in a Newcastle court for uh, not reporting sexual abuse that was within his diocese, is uh, about to be sentenced. So that will happen sometime soon. Uh, uh, proceedings there are just getting underway. We'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah. And Melbourne's got a new Catholic Archbishop starting August 1. From also, who's come over from... Broken Bay, so from yeah. in the c- central coast of New South, in South Wales. Wales. And uh, the Adelaide uh, Archbishop, who's been sentenced for what happened in Newcastle before he went to Adelaide. Uh, I think, am I right in saying he'll be the first person, the first priest in the world who will be convicted and sentenced in relation to not reporting sexual abuse? I think that would be right. Certainly not at that level. Certainly not at uh, Bishop or above. Yes. John, I have a couple of things. Um, Here's someone applies for a job for you and it would appear, and and he makes a a job application and later on... uh, uh, declares that he's been ex- uh, convictions for accessing child porn and being in possession of child pornography. As a result, didn't get the job. Mm. Made a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. Yes, and, and uh, they investigated it and came up with a fairly curious result. Well, the ruling was based on a view that the criminal record on its own couldn't be a basis to impugn bad character. And you can work for an insurance company... In a call centre, even if you've this got a conviction... This wasn't a call centre, this was from home. From yep. home, oh, OK, yep. but answering the phone, yes, doing yes, phone yes, work, yep. mm-hmm. uh, even if you've got a conviction for child porn. Because that's not a... Um, uh, it's not on its own a ground to impute bad character and that he ought to be compensated for discrimination to cover hurt, humiliation and distress. I couldn't... Look, I haven't read the facts and I haven't read the judgment, but on the face of it, and I see that a fair few politicians have weighed in too, it is... Uh, a surprising outcome. Yeah, it seems to be the contrary to the way... Uh, I mean, my view is you make a disclosure and you make a... I would have thought you were entitled to make some assumptions on the basis of convictions. Uh, and let's just... Uh, so I'm... Suncorp, it was the employer at the moment, is absolutely refusing to pay a fine imposed. So... Um, it will be interesting to see what happens. Now, uh, Rebel Wilson's case... Yes. Now, she's the Hollywood actress who claimed and got $4 million and more in special damages for lost earnings out of Justice Johnny Dixon in the the Supreme Court here. And then there was a Court of Appeal that was reduced to $600,000. Yep. Um, From $4 million plus down to $600,000. By the time she's paid her costs, she's a net payer. So she's net out of pocket as a consequence of the trial and the appeal. And after allowing for the... And then there was an argument about whether they were entitled to interest on the refund of damages and they were found they were entitled to interest. Um, so at the end of the day, there's a... You know, you bring a huge defamation action, you're successful and you're out of pocket. I'd love to know if there were negotiations and discussions between the parties between the result of the trial and the result of the appeal to resolve it without leaving it to the lottery of the appeal court? Well, I would have thought... I'd like to know that too, but two things... <laughs> we nev- I don't think we ever will, will we? No, no. Well, no, not over perhaps a dinner in a few years' time, but there were uh, there was a thing called a call-to-bank offer, and it's a... Um, there was a... Which is based on what principle? Uh, and the what I do is I make an offer to you to settle. Now, normally, we make offers that have couched in straight money terms. A uh, call to bank offer is an offer that's it might be based not on money, but you, and but it's an offer to settle the matter on a particular basis. Mm-hmm. And if at the end of the day it results in a decision in your favour that is worse from your point of view than the offer that I've made to you, then I'm entitled to go to the court and say, look, if they'd accepted this offer six months ago, two years ago, eight weeks ago, um, we would have all saved some money and therefore I think that this person should make pay my costs from today. So the costs from the rejection of the offer date onwards were all unnecessary and should be borne by the party that wasn't prepared to be reasonable. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's the... And that happens pretty much... 
Oh, it happens every, every day. day. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thousands lots of, of times lots over of times. in yes. so many disputes. Yes. Yep. So, um, so that's uh, you know a salutary lesson for people running a defamation action. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Attorney General, Federal Attorney General, has introduced new laws to protect victims of serious family violence from having to directly subject to be cross-examined by perpetrators or alleged perpetrators. So it's not just there needs to be a finding. If there's an accusation, you can oppose the granting the the cross-examination in a trial. Um, which I find would be that you would then need to make sure that the person who was undertaking the cross-examination was fully and properly briefed. So presumably, if if you're not entitled to cross-examine someone, you are entitled to be uh, to legal aid for the purpose of undertaking the cross-examination. And that reminds me, there's also been a review of federal legal aid, in particular for overseas cases. The new Attorney General says we're spending too much money on people on war crimes trials and people on sex charges in Thailand, and we're going to look at tightening that significantly in the well, future. $525,000 was the cost of uh, uh, providing legal representation to someone in the southern Philippines. Yeah. Ouch. Huge amounts of money. Yes. All righty. Thank you. So Tom. I think that's welcome too. Peter in Ballarat's first up for today with our talkback lawyer, David Whiting. Morning, Peter. Good morning. Thank you for taking my call, John and Mr. Whiting. Um, I've got a real estate problem. I bought a house in Ballarat and uh, I, I wanted to sell it. So the estate agent came around and uh, then I said, no, I don't want to sell it. And he said, yeah, okay. And he gave me a letter to say that he releases me from the authority. So you'd and already signed an authority, had you? Yes, I had, Mr. Whiting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Would you call me David? Mr. Whiting yes. makes me feel mildly uncomfortable. Yep. Okay, yes. okay David. And uh, since then, I've seen I reckon Lord, Lord Whiting would actually be better, <laughs> Peter. At your worst of pleasure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, you, so you signed place, an authority, yeah. and then what happened? And what they, they claimed expenses for advertising and things like that, and then they sent me another letter to say that we are prepared to write off the advertising expenses but must be paid the commission outstanding. Which is how much in dollar figures? It's uh, $6,000. $6, but they didn't, they didn't sell, did they? No, 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 no. no and, another did, agent sold. Ah, and, okay, okay, there's the catch. All yeah. right. Um, here's, here's what normally happens, Peter, is you sign what's called an exclusive authority. And the exclusive authority says if the property is sold by me as the agent or indeed by anyone else in the exclusive authority period, you agree to pay me commission. Uh, now, what's happened is, presumably, within the exclusive authority period, you stopped acting, you stopped engaging Agent A and engaged Agent B. Yes, yes. Um, but, and they, when you got a release from the first agency agreement, what did you tell them? That I didn't want anything to do with them at all. It's not that you didn't want to sell it, it's just you didn't, didn't want to deal with them. Yes, yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. they gave you a letter that said you're released from the authority... Yes, and, and, and the other estate agent saw that and said, that's good, now I can sell the Okay, property. all right, So they, and they've hit you with some advertising fees. And they want a $6,000 commission. Well, they'll have one or the other, presumably. What, what's the answer, Peter? They want one or the other? They, they, they want the whole lot. They want the advertising fee and the commission as well. Well, uh, then the, my view would be from what you've told me, you've got no obligation to pay them commission because they've released you from your obligation. Um, what, but for the for a $6,000 fight, I would consider that you might like to go to VCAT for a declaration from VCAT that it, they, in fact, you don't owe them any money. They're, they're going to send me to the VCAT people. Well, so, no. They're, so they've issued an application at VCAT to recover money from you? Yes, yes. Okay, well, VCAT will determine whether you owe them or you don't owe them. Right. All right, but you hang on to that letter very preciously. And okay. very important, is it, David, to develop a timeline of what happened on which day and in what order who said or wrote what to whom? Yeah. All right, yep. Peter? Okay, all right. So I, I, I just listen. Tell it to tell you the truth. I haven't got six thousand dollars. I'm on a pension. But you sold your house, didn't you? 
Yeah, but they didn't, I didn't bother Tom. I bought this old commission joint here and done it up. Yeah, um, the, the issue is not whether... You, the real issue is what was the contract between you and the agent and did it come to an end by the operation of the letter that you got from the agency? All right. Now, good luck with that, Peter. Just prepare a timeline of all the conversations and letters so you've got them all in order. That'll help a lot when you go to VCAT in order to say this is unfair. And in Emerald, good morning. You're through to David. Good morning, David, and good morning, John. I'm wondering whether a, a stat desk, which has been supplied for a committee, can be questioned. We have had a, a member organize a function providing a stat deck because she cannot find the receipts for this function yes and i'm wondering how can we question that or is it allowable so i, I take it you 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 have an interest in the organization yes. and someone's mm. come along and said i'd like reimbursement for expenses exactly and these yes. are the expenses that i have incurred how much are we talking about um I mean, are there individual items of ten dollars, or individual items yes. of a thousand dollars? No, not up to a thousand. But there, there are small, small items and larger items, such as up to um, three hundred dollars or so. That's what is now owed, but the amount uh, we were questioning. Well, um, I, I would be surprised that there is no evidence available as to the major items. You know, if I walked into the news agent and bought some sticky tape, I wouldn't expect to keep the receipt. But if I was to buy three hundred dollars worth of something somewhere, then I would have expected it a release or a credit card statement, which would indicate the transaction. It's really a question of, in my mind, whether you think that the overall total is reasonable or unreasonable. But you're certainly entitled to say, as an as a that the organisation's entitled to say that they're not prepared to accept the evidence if that's what they choose to do. All right, I hope that helps you. And just before we move to our next caller, David, the former Archbishop of Adelaide, Philip Wilson, has been sentenced to six months in prison for failing to report and for covering up child sex abuse by priests under his command, under his uh, his control. Uh, the first time in the world that uh, a senior clerical figure has been sentenced to any form of punishment, but in this instance, jail, for failing to do anything about sexual abuse within his diocese. Six months jail, which um, I might say is contrary to most predictions, which were that he wouldn't spend any time behind bars, but would be sentenced to various forms of non-custodial punishment. Uh, is, well, I suppose we now need to see whether he's going to appeal against the conviction and or the sentence. He uh, may indeed, but given yep. no one's ever been convicted of this offence before, there is no tariff, there's no precedent. No. So no. The, the presiding judge has had to basically break new ground and says six months jail is the appropriate penalty. So uh, watch this space. Maureen in Moriac. Morning, Maureen. Hi. Enjoy your program immensely. Thank you, I'd that's like, kind. I'd like to talk to you and get David's advice. Um, I have an estate matter. Yes. That, um, my mother passed away 90 weeks ago, so we're talking about 2016. Yes. And the other co-executor will not finalise the um, estate. We're not talking about a, a whole lot of money. I'm a pensioner and my sibling is quite wealthy. We have... My solicitor is absolutely fabulous, doing everything possible. Maureen, what needs to be done to finalise the estate? Who knows? Are you an, I've, are I've you an executor? I've signed all my papers. Are you an executor, Maureen? I'm a co-executor. Okay, and what was in the estate? Uh, accommodation bond. Yes. And a hundred thousand dollars in the National Australia Bank. And have you got the? Presumably, all that's been collected. Yes. And where is it sitting now? At, uh, at, at, at the lawyer acting for the estate. Yes. And so, you know, I, I'm really not very well off. No. And so every fortnight's a squeeze. So um, so I went to the legal services om ombudsman. Yes. And they, they said to me, do this and this. And then... Nothing happened. 
So then we went to the Professional Standards Association. But, which but, is it- but, it, but Maureen, this is an accusation made against an executor, or is it an accusation made against the lawyer for the estate? It's both. Mm. Okay. And okay. So we've been to the Professional Standards Association, and that they, they say there's nothing they can do. They, they can make a phone call, give them a little tap on the wrist, but they cannot do anything. And that's because, because I've got, well, at the moment I've got a complaint involving a lawyer acting as an executor who 19, 19 months after probate has yet to make it, the state's fully distributed, won't make a claim for commission, so won't give my client the balance of the money. And the difficulty is, is that it's, it's a, a dispute between an executor who happens to be a lawyer rather than a dispute between someone and a solicitor in the conduct of his or her practice. So that's the issue. So so in terms of Maureen's issue, Maureen's issue is she's using, if you like, she's using the lawyer to get a go, to have a go at her brother. Is that about right, Maureen? Maureen? Yes, that's exactly right. So, So there's the problem. In a sense, the lawyer is the jam in the sandwich and you're trying to squeeze the lawyer when your real issue is with your brother. Who I don't speak to. Mm. Well, other than via his lawyer. Mm-hmm. So, you uh, know, in a real on in the the brutal answer is it's an application to remove him as executors, as executor, and to use his share of the estate for the purpose of paying your cost in relation to the application. Yeah, I'm concerned about this, Maureen. How how much money are we are you expecting from the estate personally? Probably a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Under 200. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would hate to see you entering into litigation where that on the estate is going to pick up the bill for both your brother's costs and your costs and you start diminishing the pool from which you will get your share. Exactly. And I'm uh, worried it better, about that too. Isn't it better? Is there anyone who's an intermediary that the family could call on that both of you will listen to and trust someone who can sit down and conduct a kind of a mediation between you? Uh, not really. Is there an uncle or a family friend or a trusted doctor or priest or someone in the, the the extended family who could sit you both down, maybe in different rooms in the same building at the same time and do a backwards and forwards and get it resolved? I, I doubt so. Um, Can you think of anyone? No, not really. Because I'd hate to see you spending tens and tens of thousands of dollars each, which comes out of your share of the estate. Exactly. See, what I... What I really, also another thing I wanted to do, who funds the Law and Legal Services Commission and the uh, professional standards? Because they're, they're not prepared to do anything. They just said, we'll make a phone call. And I said, who's paying? Lawyers, it's not the lawyer's wrongdoing, Maureen. On what you've told me, it's your brother's refusal to allow the lawyer to finalise. So you both have what you might call spoil rights. That's your problem, Maureen. So it's, as John suggested, what you really need is for someone to pick up a phone and talk to your brother and say, what's the problem? Someone he what will trust it, and listen to. What will it take to resolve this? Who does he, Someone he respects who's prepared to have a word and say, look, come on, this is not helping anybody here. He doesn't even talk to his own children. He is a bit of a problem. Okay, well, I I hear all of that, but I'm still I'm I'm trying to put into your mind some ideas on what might be a better way of doing it. Other and, than and, you, and and overall, there could be a spend of thirty to forty thousand dollars to have the argument about whether he should or shouldn't be removed. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for Thank your you. help. All right. Otherwise, yeah, you can understand that it's if you want to blast difficult. him out, Maureen, if you want to try and blast him out, then. I mean, sometimes people enjoy that sort of a fight. They enjoy spending the estate's money. They don't care if he's got lots of money. He doesn't care if he spends forty, fifty, a hundred thousand dollars no, having no. a fight about it. And you do care. You care deeply. So, and he knows that. So he sort of he's almost daring you to go there. And he's been the, and he was the golden haired boy. So well, I don't want to get into the family politics. That's <laughs> way out of our area. All right. Thank you so much. All right. I don't know that we've been much help though, David. Have we? No. Um, what you do is it now starts is you recognise I'm going to go to court so you next spend the next three months writing the letters that make your case look as good as it possibly can be. There is that. David and Elwood's next. Morning through. David, you're through to David.
Oh, good morning, gentlemen. Um, recently, I received a car insurance renewal from one of the major companies. Thought it was a bit high, so I went online to the website and came up with a pretty similar result. But I played around a bit, and I worked out that only the address where the car is usually kept overnight had had um, was was causing the difference. So, if I said that the car was parked somewhere or any other house in the street, my policy would halve. Um, and interestingly enough, quotes for any other car model um, came out the same as my neighbours. So the, the software is clearly predatory on um, existing customers. So sorry, is this? Are they saying if you're parking it in a garage instead of on the street, the premium? No, it's the, the, the no, parked no. On that's the what's happened is the software package is recognising that David of Elwood is an existing insured customer, exactly, and exactly. therefore my policy is two thousand dollars. But on the yeah. other hand, if he was a new client at a different address it would only be $1,000. In order to attract new business yes. and then slowly build the premiums up or, over time anyway. Quickly, yeah. yeah. David, I'm going to interrupt just a second. The magistrate in the Philip Wilson Archbishop case sentenced to jail uh, has asked for an assessment on whether or not the Archbishop can be would be suitable for home detention for some of that period of time. So there's a little more to this as it's starting to come out from the court. Uh, 12 months jail, six month minimum, and could some of it or all of it be, a, could he be assessed for home detention rather than incarceration in an actual prison? Now let's get back to David from Elwood's problem. Uh, is this allowed, David? Can insurance companies do this? Everybody does it, John. Telephone really? companies do it. You know, the answer, you know, telco will, will have a great deal, but it's not available to existing clients. The difficulty is is that, I mean, I've had uh, internet service provider accounts that have just, uh, you know, you see they've got these absolutely great deals, but they're not available to existing customers. So they all do it. David. Health funds do it. Hi, David. Right. Now, um, I... I've got an idea for you, David. You should have your car garaged at your neighbours and your neighbours could have their car garaged with you. Exactly. Yep. Now, the car is parked on the street, so um, which house it's actually parked at varies um, overnight. Yeah? So why so would you I, not... Why, I, say that I mean, I, have a look at the product disclosure statement, yep. but if you were to garage, if you were to park the car outside your next-door neighbours and after you've got the policy engaged, tell them that you've now moved the location of the car. Uh, the other alternative, David, and I've done this, I'm sure... David Whiting has too. Uh, you ring them up, say, I've noticed that this is where my premium is and I've noticed this happens and uh, uh, I've got a much better deal being offered to me by insurance company X and insurance company Y and insurance company Z and I won't hesitate to move to them unless you're prepared to do something about my premium. Now, now fortunately, I also own the house next door. So if oh. I say that um, that's where it's now garage or now parked outside... Have you tried ringing them up, though, and saying to them, I'm, you're going to lose my custom? Um I, I haven't, but I told this to a, a friend of mine who had exactly the same situation, and he did. They reduced his premium, yeah. but, but not down to the um, 50% value. That yeah. they... Then have the discussion. See what you're prepared to do. All righty. Uh, in fact, it's astonishing how much movement you can get in the course of even a conversation with phone companies, insurance companies... Or, yeah, lawyers. Or, yes, all sorts of things. John. Yeah. Perhaps not so much for lawyers. But <laughs> yes. Barry in Clifton Hill, morning to you too, Barry. Oh, good morning. Uh, look, I'm not sure if this is actually a legal question, so I'll keep the preliminaries short. Um, it's about my grandfather's diaries, um, war diaries, who are in the possession of my cousin. He promised to give us a copy of the diaries two years ago, um, but now is not receiving calls or responding to calls to, to honour that. So I'm just wondering if, if there's some sort of legal process I can threaten him with or uh, take action with to just to get access to the diaries. Barry, to Barry, who owns the diaries? Well, they were my grandfather's. No, I understand that, but his my, will... My cousin, well, his... my cousin has... Uh, I don't think they were subject to a will. Well, if your grandfather, so, your grandfather has died... Yeah. Then, then whether it was the intestacy rules or, or a will, there will have been a formal devolution of ownership. So we'll it's be able to say... It's part of his estate, even yes. if he didn't specifically identify no. it, it is part of his estate. So he gives it to... His widow inherits the estate, they're now hers. 
right? Uh, now, she then died, and therefore they're now somebody else's. So that's what's happened. It's okay. gone to his, his son, who is my cousin's father. Yes. So, gone so the answer the... is they went there, and they've now that person has now passed them on. So okay. ownership of the diaries now rests with your cousin. So, by default, sort of thing. Well, not by default, by, by the operation of the decision made either by his father or his father's executor. By law, okay. effectively, Barry, by the process of administering his estate. Well, it'd be just by by his father passing him on. Well, that's yes. how yep. it works. In which it's the same, as, the same as if it was a parcel of shares or a family heirloom watch. Or a family Bible or something Or whatever like that. else. It's part of his estate. Yeah, I understand. So you have an interest in it emotionally, but David Barry wouldn't have an interest in it that's recognised at law by the same No. Uh, can we then think, John, that there's an interest in the copyright that is, in a sense, the words, mm -hmm. and there's an interest in the physical document? Yeah. And I would have said that um, you've got to, you need access to the physical document and you're only going to get that with the agreement of your cousin. Is there argy-bargy about getting access to it, Barry, or is your question in theory? No, no. It, it, he, he made a promise to my sister that um, she wanted... The, the information, so he promised to give her, her a coffee, coffee, yep. and I've been following it up because he just hasn't done a, a okay. made a copy. So you, and so I'm just I, I want I have an emotional interest in those diaries. Sure, as well. you want a facsimile made for other family yep. descendants to go right. parallel down the line along with whoever holds the original. But if there's no argument about it, then but he's just not talking. He's not. He uh, must recognise my. Barry, can I suggest that what you want to do is give him a process for achieving the outcome? Because I can imagine he wouldn't want to hand them over and be in exactly the same position as you are currently yeah. in. Yes, so, so it's, um, you know, I found a place who'll copy them. And this how is many, who they are. How many, I'm prepared to pick up the bill. How many branches are there on the family tree, Barry? Uh, very few. There's really only my... There's a father and... and sorry. How many my other cousins and, and are there? my uncle. So there's um, three people who are descendants of this diarist grandfather. Well, there's four on my side and two on his side. Okay, so there's six. So, in fact, what you're saying to the custodian of the family war diary is can we have it taken to where th copies are made, facsimiles are made, not just, you know, your local office works or whatever, uh, someone who will handle it with appropriate uh, care and get multiple copies made for everybody whilst you hold the original and get back the original. Isn't that the conversation you need to have? Yes, but the problem is he, he won't respond to my call. So, so I was wondering whether I could get a court order or... You uh, won't. No, the answer would be... To... You can only get a court order if you can prove you've got a right to them and you don't. Yeah. So what about the other people who... The other five people along with you, Barry? If all of you together sign a letter if it comes to that or if you have a you know, some sort of an informal and less threatening way of saying, look, come on, this is this is our shared heritage and see if you can do it without resorting or threatening to resort to court. Yes. Oh, well, I guess it would be in a form of a letter that would be lived to his home. That um, With everyone else, to... with you and the other cousins and everyone else who share the same interest, David, would you get them all to co-sign? I'd get them all to co-sign, but I think it's really important that the cousin's, if you like, control of the document is not lost. Yeah. So you offer a scenario where it's given to a particular place yeah. to be handed over by him and to be returned back only to him. So you do all the all the footwork and say, here, I've found this particular archivist. Or an organisation who can do it for us. Yeah, not, not someone who's going to treat it inappropriately or roughly or not some kid who's employed in a photocopy shop, but here's someone who will do this will do it with appropriate grace and care and professional attention, make six copies and everybody's happy. Yep. All right, I hope that helps. It would be a delicate issue. It's the same when family law, you're fighting over the family photographs, for instance, and that's been uh, much litigated too. Yeah, well, I've got one at the moment where there's a there's some, more, some more diaries from a prisoner at Changi, and uh, we're trying to work out where in the family they will go or would do that we send them to the war memorial. Mm -hmm. And I've got a text message. Our grandfather landed at Gallipoli. One grandson has all the memorabilia. Dog tag, leather strap he wore, medals, pay book. He's decided to get copies of everything for everyone and the originals go to the war memorial so no one member of the family has the originals. So replicas yeah. of everything. 
I, I, that's the way my when my father-in-law died, he and then his brother died. They, they had most of the memorabilia for their father. We all made copies and gave them to everybody. Yep. David, thank, thank you. you John. Uh, enormous variety of questions being thrown at you today, and as always, uh, somehow you managed to negotiate a path through such extraordinarily different types of questions. Thank you, John. Thank you. David Whiting, our talkback lawyer, helping you with free legal advice.